All right, good morning, everyone. So this is gonna be our first lecture. Um, not exactly how I had it planned, um, but unfortunately my little one was throwing up all night, so I'm home with her. But go ahead and do your best, guys. Um, we're gonna go ahead and kind of go through these first two pages of notes together. Um, write down what you see on the slides, what I talk about, examples I give, whatever might help you better understand the material, the terms, um, and help you remember it. So we will go ahead um, and cover all of this information in labs that we're going to be doing next week. Um, so it will help reinforce those concepts and those terms that you're going to hear today. Um, do make sure that you have those two pages done in your notes. Uh, they will be checked in on Monday uh, for completion. So I'll be looking to see that you have both pages done um, and that you have watched the entire video through Edpuzzle. Also, there will be um, an entrance ticket on Monday. So have your notes with you, not only to have them checked in, but also to be able to be used on the entrance ticket. So if you do a good job on the notes, you should be able to do very well on the entrance ticket coming in on Monday. If you guys have any questions, as always, go ahead and email me, um, and otherwise have a good weekend. So let's get started. All right, so first off, um, we're just going to be looking at just kind of what is science and some very simplistic ideas of kind of how do we do science. So first off, science is simply just an organized way of gathering and analyzing evidence so that we can learn about things. Um, it's a very specific uh, way. There's certain steps to it. And we go ahead and we gather any data that we can collect. We look at that data, see what it tells us, and it helps us better understand what's going on in the world. Um, now, the big thing about science is that it is constantly changing. We're always getting new data, new evidence that causes us to change what we thought we maybe previously knew or to add to what we already know. So science always is changing. There's always new information coming out um, and it's always being updated. Now, goals of science, um, why, why we do science. Uh, the big thing is, is that we wanna provide explanations for events that are happening. Okay, we wanna be able to use those explanations to understand patterns. Think about how in where we live in the Midwest, we know that we have kind of a tornado season. Okay, we know that we likely aren't going to see tornadoes in months of December, in January, in February. But we do know that there's a better chance of seeing a tornado in the spring and in the summer months due to our weather patterns. So we know that there's a pattern to when we might see those natural disasters. Same things for hurricane season. Okay, it helps us make very useful predictions to go ahead to go ahead and be able to um, predict what may or may not happen in the future. Um, and weather is that perfect example to go ahead and think of that. Okay, but as far as science goes, we just we really are trying to explain kind of what's happening, why is it happening, um, why might we see something occur in a certain pattern, and then be able to predict that. Okay, same thing. Think about all that's going on right now with COVID. We're looking at these different variants. We're trying to make predictions as to how it's going to affect people, um, how it's going to affect the uh, efficacy of the vaccine. So same thing. We're trying to understand something through the goals and ways of science. Now, how we do science Okay, how we get an explanation about what's happening, how we learn about these patterns so that we can make predictions. We do science through the scientific method, and you guys have heard this before. Um, so there's very specific steps to it, um, and those steps are listed here on the slide. Okay, so we first, we start with an observation. We simply just notice something. Then we're going to develop that hypothesis. We're going to test it through an experiment. During that experiment, we're going to collect data, and we're going to then analyze that data. And then lastly, we're going to go ahead and form a conclusion. What did we learn from that data, from that experiment, and what can we go ahead and add to our previous knowledge um, of what we observed? So a perfect example um, that we probably all have gone through before is thinking about what has happened um, when your phone does not work. Okay, let's say your phone's dead. Uh, and think about how you pull on 
what might be wrong, okay? Observation, you notice your phone's not on, okay? You might try to turn it on. You might try to go ahead and charge it, okay? You might let it sit on the charger for 15 minutes or so and see then if you can get it to turn on. Going through those steps is you doing the scientific method, okay? You observed something out of your norm, okay? You see your phone's not working, and you're going to go ahead and hypothesize what might fix it, and you're going to test it. You're going to throw it on the charger and see whether or not that that, in fact, does or does not fix it. Okay. Same thing whenever you guys start driving. Okay. Think about what if your car won't start? You might go ahead and start thinking, okay, well, my car's not starting. What could be wrong with it? Okay. Maybe the battery's dead. Maybe it's out of gas. Maybe there's a major problem that there's something wrong with the transmission. What else could be going on? And then you might try to fix it. Okay. Maybe you go ahead and you add some gas. Maybe you go ahead and get a jump to your battery to see if that's going to fix it. But we walk through this scientific method every day with our problem solving. We just don't realize it. Okay. But those are those very specific organized ways of doing science. And you guys will see, we'll do it throughout our labs throughout the course of the school year. All right. Now observations and asking questions at very first step. Okay. We use all five senses. Okay, we're using, we're seeing, we're hearing things, we're smelling things. Typically in science, we're not really tasting things because we might not know um, what we're tasting and it could be a chemical. But we use our five senses to go ahead and observe something. And then that usually leads us to ask a question. Okay, a um, good example would be if you look at this guy here. Okay, you might be wondering what in the world are these little white nubby things on its back? Okay, it looks different. Um, it looks something out of the norm. Okay, when you think about like a caterpillar or something, you probably don't envision these little white guys that are sticking to its back. Um, and then you might start asking questions and wonder what's going on. Okay, and that's that observation. Um, realistically, these are eggs. It's really gross. It's uh, from what's called a parasitic wasp. It lays its eggs on this caterpillar. Um, and it then those eggs as they're developing are using all the nutrients from that caterpillar to develop um, and it actually ends up killing the caterpillar in the end. It's super gross and super weird. Um, there's some really good YouTube videos of it, um, like a time lapse watching it happen. So uh, check it out, but it's, it's very gross. So uh, next, we're going to go ahead and look at after we've made those observations and we've started asking questions, we're going to go ahead and make a hypothesis or we're going to make a claim. Um, a lot of times when we have a question, we're going to go ahead and pull on what's called an inference. An inference is where we're going to use previous knowledge, things that we've already known. Okay. You guys know that if a car doesn't start, might because might be because the battery's dead or because the gas ran out. Okay. You guys know that if your phone doesn't start, if it's not working, you might need to do a hard reset. You might need to put it on the charger. These are things that you've learned along the way from previous experiences. So when we go to form a hypothesis, we use inferences. We use our previous knowledge, our background knowledge to form that hypothesis. Okay. Now, when we write a hypothesis, very, very, very important, it has to be testable. Okay, when we're using and creating a hypothesis, the whole point is so that we can test it, we can experiment and see whether or not that hypothesis is correct or incorrect. Okay, so when we're writing a hypothesis and we pay attention to how we're writing it, we want to make sure that it's something that we can actually test in the lab. Um, now, when we're talking about a hypothesis, really we're just looking for a possible explanation or think of an answer to our observation. Okay, our phone's not working. What could be wrong? Okay, well, the battery could be dead. That's something that we could definitely test. When we write a hypothesis, there's two different ways that we can write it. You guys have typically heard of the if-then statement, okay, um, and we'll talk about these variables in a minute, and we'll practice hypothesis writing in class, okay, but you can go ahead and use an if-then statement. Um, if the battery is dead on the phone, then the charger will go ahead and uh, allow it to work, okay? Something very simple. You don't need a big explanation. Um, you don't use any I or we or they or my, okay? Um, it's written as a very simple statement. It's written um, not as a question, 
Okay. So all these things you should pay attention to when you're writing hypothesis. Okay. It's a very simple sentence statement stating what the answer is. Okay. Or the possible explanation as to what you're asking. Um, another way that you can write it is you can actually skip using this whole if then statement and you can just write it as what we call a claim where you're simply just answering kind of the question that has been posed. Okay, so you don't have to do if this, then this will happen. You can simply just write a very quick statement or a claim where you would say the battery is dead and it needs to be charged. Okay, um, something very simple as that. So as we get into labs next week and as we do more labs throughout the semester, you guys will get more practice with writing a hypothesis um, and getting better at it. All right, after we have that hypothesis, now we have to actually go ahead and we have to test the hypothesis. Um, one of the big things is when we develop an experiment and we create an experiment to test this hypothesis, we want to make sure that we're only changing one thing. We're only changing one variable because if we change more than one item in the experiment, we're not going to know which one is actually causing the answer or the data that we see. Okay, so for example, if the car isn't starting, and not only do we add gas to the car, but we also jump the battery at the same time, and then the car starts, well, we don't really know which one was the problem. Was it the gas that fixed it, or was it jumping the battery that fixed it? So whenever we're experimenting, we only want to be changing one thing at a time, so we know that that one thing that was changed is causing the data that we see. Okay. Um, now, when we do set up an experiment, we're going to have an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group is the group that's actually going to be receiving the independent variable. They're the ones that we're going to actually be testing on. Okay. Control group, they're going to be the group that is going to be exposed to all the exact same conditions as everything the experimental group is getting, except it's not going to get the independent variable. We're going to use this group as a comparison. Okay, so maybe we want to go ahead and see the effects of fertilizer on grass growth. Okay, well, fertilizer we're going to go ahead and use on grass seeds in the experimental group. Control group, we'll just have some grass seeds growing as normal without any fertilizer to see how well does the fertilizer in the experimental group make an effect on the grass growth. Okay, so typically we always have two groups in an experiment. We have the one group that is actually being tested on. Oops, sorry guys. We have the group that's actually being experimented on. And then we have the group that isn't getting anything extra, no extra variable. So we can compare and see how did that variable change the data. All right, variables. Okay, so these are the different parts of our experiment. So when we look at experimental variables, the big one is the independent variable. This is the variable that is being changed by you, the scientist. Okay, and this is the one where we only have one of these in the experiment. So we know that that one variable is the one causing our data to respond. Okay, so independent variable, a good way to think of it. Independent, I change it. Okay, I am the one changing the independent variable. So I am the one choosing to add fertilizer. I am the one choosing to add gas to the car. I am the one choosing to jump the battery. Okay, it's the thing that you're choosing to test out and to see what happens. Now, the dependent variable, that is the one that's going to be observed. You're going to see and collect data on it. Okay, you're going to go ahead and see what is the response to that independent variable that you're testing. Okay, how much does the grass grow in response to me adding fertilizer? Okay, does the car start in response to me jumping the battery or me adding gas to the car? Okay, so the dependent variable, that's the one you're observing throughout the experiment and the one that you're going to be collecting the data on. Now, there's also another variable. It's called the control, but realistically, we always use the word constants. It makes it a little bit easier to remember. Okay, constants are all the other variables 
or parts of the experiment that are going to stay exactly the same across the board. Okay, we want to make sure that again, there's only one variable, one thing that's actually being changed. Everything else has to stay exactly the same so that we know that only that one thing being changed is what's causing our results. Okay, so constants are things that stay the same across the board. So if we're going to go ahead and look at grass and the effects that fertilizer has on its growth, we're going to make sure that other than the fertilizer being added, everything else is the same. Same amount of grass seed, the same containers, the same amount of soil, the same amount of sunlight, the same amount of water. Everything else is staying the same other than the fact that one container is getting fertilizer and the other one is not. So we know then that the fertilizer itself is what's causing our changes in our results. Okay, so everything else that's staying the same is considered a constant. Now, the next part is during our experiment, we're going to be collecting our data, okay? We're going to collect that data so that we can make sense of what we're seeing happening in that experiment. There's two different types of data that you can collect. There is what's called quantitative. That's going to deal with, no, with any numbers and measurements. So anytime you see a number, okay, so if you see, you know, 12 centimeters, that's going to be a quantitative type of data. The other type of data is called qualitative. That's going to be our descriptions. What colors do you see? What do things smell like? Okay, what do they look like? What do they feel like? Okay, qualitative data is more descriptions. I always think qualitative data, I think of the word quality. Okay, what is the quality? How does something feel? How does something look? What does it feel like? What, does, what do you see? Okay, quantitative I always think of the word quantity. The word quantity refers to how many of something. Okay, so quantitative is going to be numbers and measurements, qualitative descriptions. Okay, um, something like a chemical reaction that creates sulfur is going to smell like rotten eggs. There's no numbers, there's no measurements, but that is a, a piece of data collection, the way that it smells when that chemical reaction occurs. So that would be a perfect example of qualitative. All right, now once we've collected that data, we look at that data, we have to go ahead and actually come up with a conclusion. A big part of our conclusion is that we have to go ahead and state whether or not the evidence, the data we collected, does it support our hypothesis that we created or does it reject the hypothesis? These two words are crucial. Every time you do a conclusion, you should see that the hypothesis was supported or the hypothesis was rejected, right? You need to know whether or not the data you collected supported what you thought or it did not, okay? So you should see one of those words in every single conclusion that you are writing. The other second piece that you should have in a conclusion is data, okay? You need to go ahead and support your conclusion with actual data that you collected in your experiment, Okay, so you need to go ahead and say, yes, my hypothesis was supported because my data that was this, this, and this shows that. Okay, or you need to go ahead and say, my, my hypothesis was rejected because this data, blank, blank, and blank, showed that it actually was not supported at all. Okay, so you need to actually pull actual data from your lab to go ahead and put that into your conclusion to help go ahead and support what, what you are saying your hypothesis is. Okay, and again, we'll practice with these things as we do some labs throughout next week. Last but not least, okay, um, in science, we can have something called a theory. Um, theory is a very loosely used term in everyday world uh, and you guys will hear like, oh, his theory was wrong or his theory was right. Scientific theory is a little bit different. Um, when you hear that something is a scientific theory, uh, it, is, it is pretty well written in stone. Um, it is a very well-tested explanation. There's been many observations, many hypotheses, many experiments. People and scientists across the world have tested it and put their data together. Okay, so... It really allows us to make a very accurate prediction 
And it really is something that kind of is in science that states something major that has happened. Um, a good example would be our theory of evolution. Okay, there are scientists across the world that have collected data, have come together and put and added to this theory. Okay, um, now one thing to remember is that a theory can change. We may get new data that causes our theory to be altered as a scientific world, okay? But a theory is very well tested. It isn't something just, you know, one person has tested their hypothesis and they say that they have a theory. It's it's something a little bit more written in stone um, and something that has a lot of backed data to it, okay? Um, so that's kind of the, the basics of our first chapter, okay? We really, we don't have too many extra lecture notes after this for this first chapter. There's just one little part we'll talk about next week on Tuesday um, about CERs. Some of you guys have done them before, but otherwise really all of this is what we're going to go ahead and practice and reinforce with multiple labs that we're going to be doing next week. So we can learn these terms a little bit better um, and understand how to write a hypothesis, how to write a proper conclusion, uh, and things like that. Again, if you guys have any questions, please make sure to email me. After this, um, you have a second ed puzzle that is for homework. It's just a short little video clip. Um, there's some questions built into it to go ahead and reinforce a lot of the terms and the concepts I talked about in this lecture. That ed puzzle video is not due until Monday morning. So if you have time in class, you can watch it. Otherwise, go ahead and just make sure that you get it done over this weekend. All right, guys, have a wonderful and safe weekend, and I will see you guys on Monday.